How do you learn who you really are? It's not found in books. It's found on the battlefield. What's up, everybody? This is Rick from the Warrior's Way Mindset. And Les McDaniel with Bearded Wisdom Podcast. What's up, guys? All right. This is a collaboration of coaches and coaches, and we're just going to get into conversations from leadership perspectives and then get into just wherever this goes. This is a couple of experts hanging out, and we'd like to bring you guys for the ride. So I'm like pretty it. excited for that. Yeah, and uh, here's the fun part, dude, is that my leadership is, uh, just so you know, I, I've, I've really started making a stronger commitment towards leaning into the spiritual side of things more and more because it's just uh, really, that's really where my heart is. and. So I'm pumped about challenging leadership into the realm of uh, spirituality, inspiration, whatever you want to call it, but spiritual intelligence for sure. So that gets uh, in the that yeah. gets in the purpose talk, man. You sure you want to start off with getting into what's your purpose? <laughs> are, you, are you sure we want to go there on our first conversations for some of these people? You can always do that, but no, no we can. <laughs> <laughs> let's stick to the script that we haven't written. <laughs> what are you born to do? Let's start. Let's just start there. <laughs> yeah, let's jump right in. Folks, prepare. Yeah. It's good. Let me tell you what you're born to do. You're ready. All right. So <laughs> I'm actually uh, speaking of purpose. Uh, I'm not going to go into my grand design purpose, but this is one of the things I'm called to do today is uh, we built a low ticket offer. That by itself isn't magnificently crazy. It's what's in it that makes it crazy. We've made this way too cheap. And I say that word deliberately. I know it's an investment in ourselves, but we've made this extremely inexpensive because we have to do our part in this world to leave a dent in the universe to help people out. So we've made this, it's a $500 program. We actually put a code on there. If you happen to see the code, it's half off. If you don't, you know, it's cool. <laughs> if you don't see it, we're okay. It's cool. It's fine if you don't, but it's there if you take the second. Uh, but otherwise, we uh, we have built this, and today I'm going to war against anxiety. Mm -hmm. I am publicly declaring that we have beaten anxiety. We have beaten it. My head coach for my women, no medication, and she had panic attacks, paralysis, couldn't do anything. Anxiety destroyed her entire universe. She now teaches how to do this also without medication. We have multiple guys who all had, they were on anxiety meds, who are no longer on anxiety meds, and they have control over this ability. I'm going to war. So what I'm doing with this, at this point, it is uh, it is May 1st, 2023. So if you're listening to this a year later, and you're like, oh shit, I want that. Listen, that's when the date was. It may You may have missed it already. But if you are anytime near this right now, we are going to make it so the first 100 people that buy this, the first 100 people that get this extremely inexpensive thing, I'm going to do a multiple thousands of dollars training on how to beat this. I'm going to have 100 people in one big Zoom call, and I'll be grabbing people out, and we're going to do exercises that have been working step-by-step, step, rewiring belief systems, getting through in, in present moment how to deal when those, those attacks are happening, and changing the uh, the ways that we process what it is so we can get off of the medication and how it works. I will show the weaknesses. I will show how to beat it. And that's where I'm declaring war. I'm going to go in and fight one of the biggest curses to at least Western society, but I think across the world. Oh, I like that, man. I like that. Well, I can just go ahead and tell you that I'm also, uh, as I've already mentioned to you earlier, that I'm going to war too, and uh, it's going to war against the uh, what other people tell me is true about me. Um, and it's one of those things where um, I've dealt with ADHD probably my entire life and didn't even really know that I had it per se up until, I guess, like probably seven years ago and uh, was dealing with some stuff. And I, I found out that maybe that's what it was. And it's crazy how that thing has been holding on like clenched teeth on onto my uh, my brain just won't let me go. And it leads to things like anxiety and it leads to things like just uh, not feeling enough and shame. And it's got a lot of different little little legs to it that I just am, I'm ready to cut cut it off at the knees and and really truly be done with that. So I love it. Let's this is a this war is good. I don't have a course yet for that. But oh, I, yeah, we, I, I, very I, much in line with your anxiety mm, war. Let's go to war. Let's go get them. I'm, ex I'm excited for you, man. 
I really love the idea too. And this gets into the idea that we're going to get into harder where we could probably talk for nine hours about this and people may or may not even get it, that it also comes down to what you said, the beliefs about me. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a training this morning, an international group that I work with, and I run the mindset training for an entire company. And when I was doing that this morning, we got into this talk, beliefs about me. And we talk about this idea of you should always believe in yourself. Like, what a, what a beautiful meme. What a lovely postcard. Believe in yourself. It's, it's lovely, right? Just do that. Just do it. And it's funny. I asked a question. I said this morning, we have the option to believe in ourselves, But what's the other option? Versus what? I can believe in myself or can you please tell me what's the or? I can believe in myself or mm -hmm. what? We're not believe. Only other thing that I could think of is not believe in myself or let everybody else tell me what I should believe. But there's still me allowing that that's, other. Sort that's believe what they think. That's not believing yeah. yourself. That's still. No. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is that I think there are a lot of people out there who are saying, hey, what, what should I think about me? Tell me more about me. Mm -hmm. Well, back in the bad cave, they can't even tell you what they think about them. And so that's the only thing is believe in yourself or don't. And, and then you're, you're at a whim, the whim of everyone else around you, right? Correct. So let's just get into the idea. Of, like, because we hear the quotes, like the Henry Ford quote, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, either way, you're right. We love it. These are great things. People love these quotes. Do you believe you can or you believe you can't? You're going to be right either way. Well, when it comes down to it, if I'm choosing not to believe in myself, what am I really choosing to believe in then? And it's a lot of, I believe I can't. You're going to be right. Your, your odds are, guys, you're always right. Some of the people out there is like, finally, somebody who gets it. I'm always right. Finally. Ah, somebody sees it. Yes, finally. <laughs> but when it comes down to it, you're always right, but it's sometimes it's stuff you don't want to be right. About. I don't believe I can do it, so I will sabotage every single opportunity to make sure I'm right. I don't believe I can do it, so I'm going to make sure I treat people in a way that makes me correct. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that I create obstacles to make sure that my excuses at least seem more viable when I try to use them. So they do not get challenged to see if I really am able to do it. I want you to also believe I can't do it. So that way you feel sorry, or at least I can get empathy or people will show, oh, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And I'm just telling you, this is so rude of you to bring up today. <laughs> sure, this isn't a personal coaching session. I just, I'm, I'm starting to catch, no, that's kidding. Dude, it is. I mean, do we not, I face this all the time. You know, I face... I think we all face this idea of uh, belief. And I think so, so much of what we do is not even conscious. We're doing it under the, underneath the surface of we are and habitually creating the story uh, so that we can actually make sure that we somehow protect ourselves. That ego is so sneaky in how it creates that space of belief versus disbelief so that we can make big claims about a vision for the future that we might have. And then turn it on its head when we, because it feels good because to tell everyone this big vision, right? Like, oh, I'm going to start this massive company. I'm going to change the world. And it's a really big vision. But then that makes the ego feel really good while he's telling that vision. And then it makes him feel even better when he can flip the switch on the conversation and say, but don't you feel sorry for the fact that I can't quite get it all done? Don't you feel sorry for the reasons why I can't get it done? I need, don't you feel sorry for me because I need help with yeah, I mean, that's why I'm calling it out because that was just literally a story that I've been telling myself about a lot of things in my own world. And I think I've done it about every hard thing I've ever had to do. You know, there's never been a moment where my ego hasn't been like, hey, I can, I have an answer. I got something to, I got something to tell you. Here's how we can set this thing up. Pretty impressive. Yeah. I really enjoy too the idea of some of the stuff that you, you mentioned it's protection. I like, like I have this great dream, this beautiful vision. It's a really big deal. And this is why people also, when they're like, uh, there's a hesitancy to making it public whenever this, I'm going to, you know, lose weight, or I'm going to start a business, or I'm going to build a dream or go for a goal. People don't want to post it. Why? Because now everybody's going to watch you. Did, are you going to do it or not going to do it? 
I believe in myself at the moment I sent that post and then I send that post and you're like, oh shit. I don't know if I should, uh, maybe I should take that down. Oh no. I have to protect myself from what? Failure, social embarrassment, looking bad in front of other people. I have to protect myself from this. And so if it goes wrong, and this is where this curse is that get lit up inside of here, where, you know, if you actually get the thing that you were hoping to get, it may be even worse. But if I then go, look, guys, I had that goal. I had that dream. I had that vision. And I posted it out there that I'm going to go for it. I had the dream. And then it was lost. The dream has been taken from me. Have you seen where my dream has gone? It has been taken. And they're like, oh, man, I feel so bad for you. That would have been so good for your family. That would have been so good. If only that could have happened, you'd have that beautiful dream. And you're like, woe is me. Feel sorry for me. And they're like, I do feel sorry for you. And they're like, really? They're like, yeah. So wait, you're giving me a lot more love and attention and recognition when I failed and lost it than when I was going for it. Really? Well, maybe I'll start up another dream that's going to fail so that mm. way I can tell you how that one didn't work too. Yes. And then I can yeah. get this love again. Yeah. At the root of this, for me, the one thing that I've been playing with a lot, and I, I know what you what you believe the, the number one thing is, uh, and I and I actually think they're closely related, but it is this the perceived nature of separation, that somehow we are separated from source, the fullness of all things, and we are somehow going to be separated from each other, from our relationships, mm -hmm. and I think that's what drives a lot of this. Is like we will do any number of things to create a space and specifically when our ego is involved to the degree of being the, the, the pilot of the ship, when we give those pilot controls over, that there is this truth about being irrelevant that has been one of my things. And, but I feel like this idea of, of perceived separation has a lot to do with the very nature of denial as you've talked about it. Mm -hmm. Know that there is the number one place that I stand is in that preservation mindset around the perceptions that I have that I actually fit in or don't, and then I will deny anything that that stands in my way that might threaten me from actually creating some sort of false perception that I am not that I do belong. When all along, well, it's a little it sounds a little circular, but it's not. But at is, the end of the day, all along, there is no separation. Is there that like is trying to control belonging so you can have connection? Yeah, yeah. That's yep. an interesting thing to do. I'm going to yeah. try and control my belonging so that yep. we can have connection, which also can get into living a false life. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a space of, of insecurity mm -hmm. because we're always in this belief system that that we will we can secure something and the moment we have it we fall into that place of insecurity because we have to protect it we will do that at all costs through denial uh perceived manipulations mm -hmm. through i mean there's any number from your map your map has got plenty of those those places where we will do anything and everything in order to be able to try to maintain our belonging yeah and uh, it's interesting that de denial disguises itself as protection. It's interesting. You want to know what the worst part about this protection system to try to control belonging for connection? Do you want to know what the worst thing that can happen is? What is it? It works. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're very, very good at convincing everybody to I control the belonging and the persona that I have and the identity I project and the way that I change my face or the way I change my energy or I do whatever, you know, these are the masks, you know, and I think I got a Lewis Howes book that's pretty good on that one, or even getting into the reality of changing your face. And this gets into makeup or gets into the different outfits that we wear. Um, I'll be talking with Tanner Guzzi soon. He gets into like the confidence in your style that's authentic and getting in with those kind of things too, where you go, I'm changing my persona to try to control how people perceive me so I belong. And if I belong, then I can get that connection. 
the worst thing is, is it works and now you're living a false life. Denial and distraction combined is very interesting because they're both designed to take as many minutes from you as they possibly can. They're designed to literally, by all definition, literally take your life. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It gets yeah. fascinating because if you combine uh, denial and distraction together, it's also the, the fast track to addiction. Designed. Oh, you may be onto something. Well, I know you're onto something. You're always onto something. But what, what if this denial and distraction are the source of what, what uh, we in the Christian world call the, the deceiver? Meaning the yes. idea, right? So, and, and really that deceiver is nothing more than this. Of course, in my world, uh, how I view it is that the deceiver is an overcharged ego. Uh, it, it's the ego who's been told that it's in the command of the ship. And it is that. It is that antithesis of that Christ consciousness that embraces it up, touches everything. I feel like it's different. I think it's, I, I think it's actually simpler than that. I, this is where I laugh. And, and we can go into devil talk. It's actually pretty fun to me. It's oh, funny I when, I, when I get into devil talk is people like come up with this idea that the devil is showing up with some sort of contract in his red Spanx and his pitchfork going, give me your soul, give me your soul. <laughs> And you're like, oh no, the devil, he's going to get my soul. Uh, my real impression, because I watch like some of these Christian, um, you know, parodies where they create these little, uh, these little skits where like the devil is trying to tempt you. And he's like, well, I'll just pray. And the devil's like, you have defeated me with prayer. So he was an angel, dude. You're not going to kill him with a prayer. Like he's, he, he, he gets it. In any case, I think if the devil really shows up, he wouldn't be like this. Give me your soul. The devil would tempt you through de denial and through distraction. But what does he do throughout the Bible? He offers what you want the most. And then he gives you an abundance. I think if you met the devil, this sure. would be the smartest, coolest, most in control, awesome, probably even humble dude you've ever met. And any scripture you ever brought up, he knows the Bible like the back of his hand. You're like, man, this guy is so well-versed. He's read 10 million books. He is connected with all. He's just, man, this is this guy is awesome. And he's like, hey, who's your favorite, you know, author? Or who's your favorite, you know, movie star or favorite musician or favorite athlete? He's like, I'm going to go hang out with them. Do you want to come with? And you're like, wait, what? You're like, yeah, oh no, I know them. You said you like them. You want to come? I'll, I'll introduce you tonight. We're, he's going to be at my place. And you're like, really? Like, yeah, come on. You're like, oh, I got work tomorrow. And my girl, I told her I'd be home by this time. And I got, you know, these things I know I got to take care of with the kids. Like, really? You're going to pass up your favorite so-and-so that you've always wanted to talk to for work tomorrow? Listen, just go in a little tired. You'll be fine. Like, all right, once in a lifetime opportunity. All right, I'm coming. This dude is awesome. And I'm going to go do this thing. And then there he's like, hey, listen, the drink's on me. Don't worry about it. You're like, no, nah, I shouldn't be drinking. Like, busy day. Like, they're free. I got you. And you're going to pass up having scotch on the rocks with your favorite so-and-so? Come on. And you're like, all right, just a few of them. Okay, it's fine. And then it's going to be awesome conversation. You're going to be in the middle of this. And you're having drink after drink. And. There's more stuff going on and people are coming in. And then all of a sudden there's like these two girls that are just like smoking model tens. And you're like, okay. And he's like, you want to meet them? Like, I do not want to meet them. And you're like, like they're just going to hang out with you and they're hanging out. And they're also really interested in what you guys are talking about. And, you know, then it starts, you know, light touch here. And you're like, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. But then light touch there. And then it starts becoming no big deal. And then now the attention is starting to get nice. And you're inebriated a little bit. So it's a little tricky. And the devil's there. He's like, you're having a great time. Anything you want is yours. What do you want most in this world? You tell me you want power. You want fame. You want more women, you want more money, you want anything, you want more, you want hang out with more people you will have to be around, I'll give you all of it. I'll give you everything that you want. And you're like, yeah, Mike, your wife blowing up your phone, you're, you're trying to ignore that, you turn that shit off. You know stuff is going, you're like, oh my God, I got all these obligations I've got, but here I am in the middle of anything that I want. Where's your restraint? This is where like alcohol, women, fame, power, money, whatever you want. And that's the attack. 
He's not showing up like, I got my Spanx on, give me your soul. What do you want the most? Yeah. What do you want the most? I'll give it to you. Yeah. Make a wish. Yeah. It's an interesting when when we discuss this, it it immediately draws me into this idea of whatever you want. And yet, you know, you described a lot of things that were things that we we think we want, like riches and aim and like all of these things. What about the people that really are just sitting around and they're they're swimming in their their other side of things? Pity, despair. And because I, I wonder where the devil is in, in the details of of the other things, the things where people feel stuck and they feel and they're still addicted to the very thing that you just put out there as a beautiful plan of, oh yeah, all the drinks you want, you know, all the women you want. Like I know dudes that would be all over that. Mm-hmm. And maybe even some women that would be all over that. And I, I think about that and I'm wondering, huh, uh, where does it, where does the devil lie in the, in, on the other side of that thing where it's okay. not so pretty, not so sexy. Every single thing that if you have, there's nothing without moderation that becomes a problem. Everything with, with too much of anything, even too much fun, too much party, like without balance, without moderation, everything becomes at some point an issue. Sure. You know, there's a, there's, you can't, you can't have so much of one thing and have everything in balance. And obviously when it gets to finances to like, I see guys, I've worked with guys who are billionaires. And when I'm working with these guys, they're like at work, I am like top, I am amazing. I run the show. I'm a king at work and I get home and my girl treats me like a peasant, like nothing's ever good enough and everything's not good. And I'm like, there's some missing pieces here. How can I be so awesome in this one category? and completely deficient in this other category. How do I do that? And I'm like, interesting, right? You thought you, if you had money that that would make everything good, but your relationships are all suffering. There's more to it than just an abundance in one category. Yeah. If you have too many women, well, how do you maintain a stable relationship? You can't, which is actually a really funny thing. We'll get into a different day with that 666, which not even religious wise, the thing that um, was going out around like what women are doing to choose men, the reverse hypergamy nonsense is happening. Six foot tall, six figures, six pack abs. Like that thing is like that. Those guys who fall in that category, which is like a. Like, think all know about this. It's like a 1% of guys that actually are in this category. Like it makes six figures with a six pack abs and over six foot tall. Like these guys are getting an abundance of approaches all of a sudden all of a sudden with this thing these guys have their pick of as many as they want who are just throwing themselves at them and these women are wondering why are these guys not committing Mm -hmm. well everybody's just giving them free samples all day long why would i have to make any purchases if i'm full from samples yeah and all the like the good guys are like why are you going off of those three like nonsense abs how tall you are and money those are that's your values and women who are getting sucked into that system are not these guys have like they're just throwing themselves at me i literally don't even have to have any value at all i'm tall i have money and i work out yeah i got a lot of them that check two of those boxes uh some of them are really short but deal breaker we found it out. It's a deal. It break. We found out. I actually did this with, and I'm not, I'm saying no names. I did this with a women's group one time where we had the list and it, it was like an 80 point list of what women say they want from a man. The men's yeah. list was like, I think it was like 12 things, but the women's, it was like, it was so long that it got ridiculous. We just did a video on TikTok with this one and it was really funny, but it's like 80 things. And I said, all right, ladies, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and see where does the, where's the vanity line at? Let's say I give you all of the things on your list. And this was a ridiculous list. It was, you know, everything from looks to finances to protector, love my kids. And it was like this huge list. And it was, I could do it. It would probably take me 20 minutes just to read it. And I went through the whole list and I'm like, okay, let's just say I give you this dude. And on top of that, I'm going to throw in, he's got a huge dick and he's a ninja and can beat up anybody. I'm going to throw all of this in there for you. And they're like, I love this package. All of the things I ever wanted on my list. And he's a badass. Like, I love it. Please sign me up. I'm like, there's only one catch. He's five foot three. 
everything you ever wanted. Every this dude is like an alpha amongst alphas. He's an That's apex the dude. For, the deal yeah. breaker for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even kidding. Like this uncontrollable know. factor. The one thing he can't control is how tall he was. He was born to be. He can't control this. And they're like, I can't do it. I can't date a dude who's literally across the board, just tens across the board, the best in every category, everything. But he's five four or five three or whatever. Like, I can't do it. I'm like, man, you are really missing a fantastic human being for this vanity. And when you went back to the ego and went back to how are you tempted, it's amazing how much we'll think we want one thing and miss all of the good stuff because yeah. we're focused so hard on that thing that we think we want. Yeah. And that bad, like, it's that bad, it's that bad in some ways. Right. I mean, it's, we, we get taught that though. I got yeah. taught that. Oh, I get it. I get it. I'm just, I'm just referring to it from the perspective of the, the guy, the gals that, you know, I grew up in that place where I was, I think I may have even spoken about this before, but always the friend, you know, ever, never the, the boyfriend. And it was, I was young. I mean, I was a little boy. I mean, I was, I was a runt growing up and, and it was and my, and my, my real name, Leslie. I mean, come on. I mean, mm -hmm. like, so I was easy to be a friend with. I was a safe place. And, and yet I was the guy who got to sit around while they were talking about all their handsome, you know, heroic football player, blah, blah, blah type boyfriends who were treating them bad. And there's the other side of it where you, that if you just, if you're just doing it over this material objectified desire kind of way of doing things, you're missing out. You are missing out. And so is the person who thinks that that's what their value is based on. A dude or that woman who who buys into this idea that that six six six. I mean, I think it's. I think there's something. I don't know what the dude six 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 is, but there is a there is a thing that for guys too who are looking for a specific. I, I think it's look. on looks. I think it's looks. I think it's like face boobs, butts. Yeah, I agreed. Mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, although I it would be a bad idea if they do have a good career, but this day and age, which is part of just our. Yeah, but it goes off of like this initial vanity thing that we're doing. Like, what is the oh. base criteria? Well, like, I like the symmetry and I like the smell, you know, and it's like caveman shit at that point, you know, which is fair. That's our base system. Our base system is I enjoy the Agreed. shapes and I enjoy the smell. And so I like her and like, well, what else is there? You know, and uh, I've been, I'm actually we could do it later in a little bit, but I've been actually attacking Disney princesses lately. So oh, that's, that's that's a totally different thing for even just that, like that, that looks and, and smell thing. But uh, I, but uh, I, I do want I do want to stick on this first a little bit longer on like the, on like the way that we are choosing each other and the way that we're basing our criteria on and how superficial and silly some of it is. But I actually fell into that bad boy thing too, as I learned when I was young, and this is where I got into when I was doing the coping mechanisms for people when they're young and choosing a mate. What the bad boy thing versus the friend zone thing? Being the nice guy means you don't get the girl. And, you know, I, I tell my ladies, I'm like, you taught us this. Like, you, you're mad at the guys, but how did you pick them? I fell into the bad boy thing because when I was young, I realized how abused I was. Like, I didn't understand the abuse that I've been through. And when I was around 15, I started turning, like, my defense mechanism of um, turning off all of my pain and turning off all my emotions. I, I was numb for, like, a handful of years. And that was my survival, you know, after, you know, my mom left, my dad was, you know, probably a clinical sociopath and the system itself was very abusive and abandoning. And there was a lot of pain, a lot of loss. There was drinking. There was all kinds of problems that were going on and I couldn't deal with it. It was me, my brother, and my sister. We all handled it in very different ways. Um, I shut down completely, turned off all emotions. I went, no medication needed. I was numb on my own. That was my safety mechanism. My sister, uh, my mom was gone during nine years old, so she needed, she needed attention. She needed love. And my dad was, you know, completely disconnected. And so the only time that she ever got any attention at that point was when she got in trouble. And so she would start getting in trouble as much as she could just to be seen. That curse never got broken. And that's an, un, that's a curse I haven't seen how to break yet. And that was one we talked about before. I'll bring up at another day if someone wants to know. And then um, my brother, he was six years old and went into severe depression. They have pictures of him, just a little kid, just depressed, didn't know how to deal. And so we handled things in very different ways on that one. 
And I realized when I was 15, like I started like recognizing the patterns of how other people, you know, in high school, if you will, like how different I was from them. And the upbringing was so uncommon in comparison. Now, each of us had broken homes, but the level of abuse was different. And so when I started recognizing I should maybe start leaning into what this is and working on my shit, I remember I had a, a girlfriend at the time and I thought, you know, I could open up my heart. I can share, like, I'm really working through some things. And I called up the girlfriend at the time and I'm like, yeah, I realized I was abused and I realized I was hurt. And I realized that I, I've been left and abandoned and taken advantage of and all these things that have just beaten me down and made me really like I'm hurting inside and I'm crying and I'm sorting through it. And she's just like, okay, you know, dang. And she listened and then, you know, we got off the phone. Uh, she broke up with me the next day. Well, that teaches me something about sharing your heart. Well, yeah. if I share my heart with you, well, then that's going to suck. You know, and at that time I started leaning in towards listening to like, you know, different music. We, I went heavy metal, but there was also this song from John Mayer called My Stupid Mouth. That's how it got me in trouble. I said too much again. So I need to <laughs> never speak up again. I'll always be a mystery to you. And so I started leaning more into like, you know, fuck everything. I don't care. I'm angry. I'm mean. I don't give a shit about nothing. Like, I don't care about grades. I don't care about authority. I don't care about none of that stuff. And if you want to know about me, I'm going to be a mystery. I'm not sharing shit. Let me just tell you, it's pretty annoying how much that works. Yeah. Because it worked. I didn't have any, I never had any issues in that category. It was like I, I had a, a, you know, a high school girlfriend. We were together for, it was, it was a good, like, three, four years-ish. And I totally fucked that whole thing because I was a mess. I was the bad boy. And just for you ladies out there who are like, yeah, I like bad boys. You're ridiculous if you think getting a bad boy means he's going to be a good guy. Yeah. Well, and I, I, yeah, my gut tells me that the reason uh, that, that that is the case or why they choose that is there's a perception that safety. is culturally... Uh, yeah, of security, of safety. Uh, oh, look at him. He's so strong. He'll protect me. And and that that is a sign of someone. I mean, even your story reflects it. It's it's the story of someone who really wants to share who they are. But it's an, it, especially in that middle school, high school, and even early college years, it's not a safe place to really be vulnerable and to open up. Because we're not teaching. And good grief. This, the, uh, this is a rabbit trail that could take us anywhere. But I mean, it was, it blew my mind when I would, I would, uh, work with youth in my, from our church, you know, our church would come over and time and time again, they had the most basic questions, the most basic thoughts that would, that made them feel like their family would reject them if they were to actually tell them. One girl told me she didn't believe in God. She proceeded to tell me about evangelicalism. And I went, I don't believe in that God either. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's like, it's not like, that's not what God is. That's not who God is. And and her description was, I don't know who, if, if I can believe this. And I go, hey, what you just said right there, that, that's it. I get that. But the whole premise is not so much about the story of God. It's about how, how simple of a conversation was this. And so our, our girls don't even feel safe. And our guys both don't feel safe to even have conversations with their own parents or fear that they're going to be rejected and not accepted or that they're, in other words, we don't, we don't know how to live into this unconditional love. Everything in our world, seems so transactional and so conditional and it's difficult. And I, I have story after story of, of youth that have gone down a path because their parents could not accept them as they were. And if the parents could have just loved them where they were, the path they went down would have never had to been traveled because they would have, they would have known my parents go to the dark places with me. They go to, they go to the bright places too. But how, how do we deal with that in a world where you're, you're talking about this idea of, uh, of a woman who likes the bad boy when, when, how do you break this cycle? How do we get out of this rut and teach our kids so that they can start talking earlier and have conversations with one another? Is it, I don't believe this is developmental. This is something that is new because we used to have to work together and we farmed with our brothers and sisters and, and, and our family. And we, we ran errands for, you know, but what is it that's happened in our world where we have literally just the guys who are at the top of their game, whatever game they play, whatever that is, whether it's baseball or they're the best singer or whatever it is, 
where those guys are rewarded based upon some sort of performance factor and not actual relational aptitude. No, no, such, a, no such thing as being able to have an adult conversation. It's all about machismo and, and I don't know what you call it when it's the, on a, with a, you know? But well, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting it's fuzzy now for women. It's I give women a yeah. lot of credit. They're really there's no real direction right now, yeah. and that's a real interesting transition for women right now. And I'd be happy to have that conversation because that's a tough one. But I, I, I got a question for you as far as this one. If we're looking like where did it go wrong? Like where did it go wrong with the teenagers being able to trust their parents? Where did it go wrong for us to be able to go like I can talk to my folks and be accepted? I got to ask you. When in history did we have it right? Yeah. I mean, I think there is something to be said about uh, the restructuring of identities in all of this. Sure. I don't have the complete answer, but I mean, in terms of, you know, there was a time when dad spoke and, and it was it was necessary because your ability to eat depended upon him being the one who was leading the family or the mom, if there was no father and, you know, back in the days when it was really harsh, mm -hmm. like I lived there, like I know anybody from that day, but you know, but back in the I mean, even, wild, even, wild did, west. Did they have yeah. it right? Were they te like kids were like, I feel heard and feel like I can share with my, my parents. I don't did know that know? they did. I don't know that they did. And yet I don't know that, I don't know that anything's broken in that regard from the perspective. I think where the conversation that we're having, you know, when it comes to this, it's it's in a place where we're teaching unconditional love that it seems so strange that we can't un open the door to what does that really mean? You'd have to teach me what unconditional love is because I don't even know what that is. I've, ne I've never seen that. Oh, you probably have. You've probably seen you've probably seen glimpses of it. And it closest, starts. The closest thing I've seen is probably with my dogs. Yeah. Oh, that's no, that's a very good one. You know why that, you know what dogs can do that? It's yeah. because they have, they can forgive in a matter of seconds. They, they it's, it's yeah. done and they're like, oh, we're back. Okay. Like I could literally take something on my desk and fast pitch it at my dog, hit him right in the head. And like, he'll be snuggling with me within like 20 minutes. hundred percent. Yeah. Like, so that's the closest thing I can think of is unconditional love would be like my dog. I don't have any other examples of no conditions. Yeah. I don't know that it's when we think of it from the perspective, again, this gets into this uh, a little bit esoteric nature. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of a swimming in the stream of faith. And I'm not talking about your religious faith. I'm talking about this idea that this whole thing is set in motion by this thing called unconditional love. And the more that I can swim in the stream of understanding that when I breathe out, trees are fed. And when the trees breathe out, I'm fed. And that there's this symbiotic nature of oneness that we all share. That when I, when myself and my wife are connected to that individually, we are, we are more, let, we, there are less conditions on how we operate. And, and I think it's less about what I can do. Can I offer it? But it's about being able to say, I'm sorry when I recognize that I'm not swimming in that stream of unconditional love that I want to be swimming in. That I've decided to get out, bail, and do something else and try to swim upstream or fight against the current or just not even swim at all. Like, I mean, when you're talking about like the trees breathe, I breathe and this symbiotic setup, are you meaning that in like the relationship, there's a degree of like, when I breathe, it helps her when she breathes, it helps me. Is that what you mean? I mean that there is nothing that is happening right now that isn't fully dependent upon everything else. Okay. It's, it's like, it's like I live in, I live, I live against a backdrop of everything else. And without that backdrop, then there is no me. And that's why I told you it's esoteric, but, the, but if we really stop and, and it's, and, and honestly, I'm tired. I'll, you've told me to lean into this, and I'm going to lean into it. Go for it. The thing that drives me crazy is, is that so oftentimes the greatest gift and the greatest ways of overcoming the things that we are facing is when we can stop and we can sit and recognize how small we are in the scheme of this whole thing. And because our world doesn't tell us that being small is good. They, they, they're like, no bigger, more, more. It's always this, like we're looking for the hockey stick that goes up. I actually saw a post today from a friend of mine who was showing how much weight he's lost over the last 90 days. And this guy said something that was pretty profound. He goes, man, that's like the only, only right side downward spiral that we want to see is that kind of thing. We, anything else in life, when it starts to go downhill and we start to see the stock market goes down, our valuation goes down, anything that starts to go down, we immediately throw it at everything. Everything that's going down is bad. 
and we're looking for that big hockey stick of light. But, but what we're talking about here is, is about a recognition that life is full. The vibration is literally an up and down motion. And that's all we are is a bunch of vibration happening. And so when we can recognize that, we are, that there's ups and downs in life and that this is the nature of all things, our, our cosmos is expanding and shrinking. I, I expand and shrink when I breathe. The trees are expanding and shrinking as they breathe. And the wind is moving things at all times. There's never a moment where there's anything that is not, there's no such thing as silence. I don't even think that we will ever experience that, even at death. I don't think silence is a thing. I think there's always vibration. And it's how I'm contributing to that or receiving it or welcoming it or resisting it that causes me to, to be out of the flow of unconditional love. And so to me, everything is about this idea of Perceived separation. It's what there was at the very beginning, from according to not just the Christian story, but going back to Egypt's story of creation, going back even further to the earliest stories of creation. It's always this idea of perceived separation from the oneness that is all things that, that even lets us even be here having this conversation. And it makes this conversation seem so trite in a way. That's what I love about it. It, it it eliminates my my seriousness, and I can't not, I can't stand here and pretend like what I'm doing today is 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 going to make a, a huge impact in the world. Except I'm here, and it is required because I am doing it. That's the only reason that it matters is because this is what we've chosen to do today. Mm-hmm. And when we can get that simple, you know, I think it. I mean, this is what this is what being present is all about. This is what it means to be begin to awaken. And I'm not saying I'm there yet because, I mean, you know, we've, we've had conversations over the past couple of weeks around anxiety and stress and fears and blah, blah, blah. And so I, I, I'm still not swimming in the stream at all times, but it is one that it is my quest to surrender to this notion that I am not separate from anything. And that's why you're Band of Brothers and why you have this. Man, that's what I love about this community that you've got. And I'm not even a part of the full community. I'm a part of you and, and this connection, and I've got some overlap with some folks. But that, that ab- ability to know that if I needed something, I can call you in a heartbeat. You're going to rearrange. You're going to do whatever it takes. And I would do the same for you. And that's, that, to me, represents the in, intention in this moment, not forever, but in this moment of unconditional love. It shows up somewhere at all times. It's just that I may not always receive it from that one individual who in that moment cannot give it. But there is still unconditional love. My my wife and I were at it, like not last week, but the week before, right? That's where where she, in that moment, and I were struggling with swimming in the waters. So what did I do? I called someone who I knew would be in the stream. And that was you. And then I called my other brother. Kelly, he was there. And I have these people that I have that are those those in those moments who are able to swim in that stream when I cannot and they can invite me in and like a little baby, just like I just I just see myself jumping in. I'm so afraid. Catch me. Catch me, Rick. (laughs) But that's what it is, right? It's that it's that it's scary. Like we're panicking and you know, we're, we're outside fighting. We're not supposed to be in that stream. We got to do something. We got to do something. And that's where our fight is. We're, 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 we've fallen out. And we're like, we're trying to figure out how to control unconditional love on our terms. And it's really not that. It's like, no, jump in. And, and we will be taken where we need to go in that space. Mm-hmm. I like it, man. I actually enjoyed the esoteric version of how you just did that. And I, I was also correlating a lot of the things that you were just working through, everything from the expanding and breathing of the universe to our size and irrelevance inside of the the presence of knowing how we're just one molecule amongst the molecules, yet we think that all the molecules revolve around us. And this fear about being separated or disconnected from all of these things, especially when you said earlier, one of the fears that you were struggling with is irrelevance versus the surrender and acceptance of our irrelevance and the size of like the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Like yeah. the conversations that we have, we do not understand the ripples that are left behind. This conversation may change somebody's life and most people will never know whatever happened. Yeah. Even if we had 30 million people listen to this, that's still not even 1%. Yeah. 
Oh no. You know yeah. what I mean? And this is why like the irrelevance versus the relevance of what it would be that may change people's lives. I've met people that have watched my videos and said, you literally saved my life. Like I've had conversations that said like I was in a relationship that I did not understand how to measure the value of myself or what I had. And I was in an abusive, toxic dynamic and your videos helped me recognize it to get. It gave me yeah. the courage and strength to live. And, and see I the next level control. and the next level of that for that person in growth is to recognize that they did have it because they showed up to listen, to be there, to be present in that moment and receive it. Correct. Because that, it's like you're talking about those 30 million, if only 1%, if 1% of 30 million, man, I love that we have that many listeners. Uh, no, <laughs> if both are correct. Uh, no, but really, if, I mean, if, if you're really honest, I mean, the opportunity of what you can listen to that's out there, people go around and I love how you even started your, your podcast starts off with, you don't find it in books. How many people sit around and quote books all day long, but they don't live according to the knowledge that they've received? Most. Right? Yeah, most people do. And then they go around quoting it and then they don't live according to it. And then it breaks down in the, internally with, with, that, with that relationship. And so I think that there is something about being able to swim in the waters together and, and to recognize that it's not a bad thing that people are reading books and then sharing knowledge because dadgummit, I love it when someone isn't applying the knowledge and they share it with me. And I go, that actually is what I needed to hear. You read that book so that I could hear it. Yeah, I'll apply and what he, you are not. Yes. And, and even, and then, and in doing so, then I can model something back and reflect it back to me. And who knows what I'm going to say that's going to honor that. And, and I think that's where we have to begin to open our eyes a little broader and to be able to see the, how everything is working together because it's that it's in that moment. It, it's the uh, Chinese farmer story mm -hmm. that, that is so going around that I, you know, I found it before everyone else. That's my you, ego. You, I think you wrote it. I think I did. I think that's I did. Pretty, Some, you just forgot you wrote it. Because it's so much. It in, yeah, I wrote it in the spirit through Alan Watts. So that's that's really, and I don't even know if Alan Watts wrote it, but he's the one who, but really it's the idea of, you know, the Chinese farmer his, uh, loses his horse and then all, the, and the neighbors are all into it. They're like, oh, how the drama, the drama, oh no, oh no. And then he's like, well, maybe, and then continues. And everything leads to, every single event leads to a good thing, then not a good thing, and then a good thing, not a good thing. It's the vibration. And the awareness of being able to swim in that water of maybes, to be able to live in that space where who knows if this is good or bad. I mean, I have a dream for myself. And what, what happens when I achieve that? I can't predict it. I can't predict what happens when I, when I gain the world that I wanted. All I can do is be present in the moment and trust that my brothers who are swimming in the unconditional love will continually hold me to that space of, Remember, this is the water we swim in. And then when I want to get out, I can get out. That's the beauty of free will. However, it's not my goal. My goal is I want to swim in those waters with guys. I want to stay in those waters of unconditional love and, and know that even when I do get out, that somebody is still there and that somebody will not, will not lose sight of me. And, that there, and it's not even about losing sight of. It's, it's that there is no difference and that's a really hard thing for a world that lives in duality to understand. If, I, if you're in the water and I'm out, we are in the water. And that's a really big leap for people to make who think that they have to earn their way. And that is a, you know, faith, by, faith without works is dead is the thing that we primarily have lived into, and, but we've done it from a duality position. And, and I think that's the point. The, the point is, is that when we, are, when we are swimming in the waters of faith, that which I'm calling unconditional love, same thing, faith and unconditional love. When we are swimming in those waters together, there is no dis, there is no separation between myself and the fullness of what is playing out. If I get out of the waters, there's a reason for that and a lesson that I needed to learn, and I had to get out of those waters. And it's and it's more about the lessons that we learn together, not my lesson. And I think that's the part that is so challenging in a world that really thinks that, I mean, this goes to the 666. No wonder people, are, girls are chasing after dudes that are 666. Because in doing so, they're creating a space where they can try to control the narrative of their life and have certain things that are fully objectification of the material things that are in front of them in exchange for something that takes care of everything that's beyond the, it goes beyond the dark bookends of our life, as you've heard me multiple times say, that 
We don't know how we got here. We don't know where we're going. All we know is we're here. And the odds and the statistics and all that you want to say about how we're here right now, it is freaking mind-blowing that we, should, we, we shouldn't be here. Like it, all odds are we should not be here. And yet here we are. And to stand in awe, this is why God in my, my work, I like to say, tell people this, God is awful. And the reason why is because he is constantly showing us things that scare the shit out of us. And I don't mean awful like we use it. It's the way the word was really intended. A-W-E full. It is awesomely full. It is beyond our comprehension full. And when we can just constantly remind ourselves of all the times we jumped out of the water because we didn't think that he really loved us. And then we're like, oh, look. Oh, he showed us that awful thing. I got to get back in the water. Like, that's scary. And, and then all of a sudden he's there. The water, the, it's always there. You know, how does that land? I think some people are going to be like, wow, what? dude, my mind is blown. And some people are going to be like. I totally agree. <laughs> but you know me, eventually they'll wake up from that slumber of the crickets. Yeah, eventually. I think, I think the, the thing is, is, is one of those things that like the what you just broke down right there would be one of those ones where people should probably go back and listen and try and like take notes on each section of it. because. You tapped into so many pieces, even on my notes, jumping into like the farmer thing and then uh, getting into irrelevance of like the fear of things and causality. And then the correlation of 666, which I wrote down, sexy, security, and safety. Like how each one starts going into like it fulfills some, one of my base needs. And that's why I choose that. Tall guys are strong and so they can keep me safe. You know, um, the finances part makes it so I have security and the abs are sexy. You know, and so these are the three things that I feel like I need. And this is how I can just immediately judge or represent that. We're getting into the fear of separation and not having presence in the present and how we have a fear of what we're doing for quality service and legacy don't actually mean anything. Yeah. Like, well, and, and that's why we have those conversations with our, that, that turn into fights. And then we later on, can we think of what, what triggered something is such a small little thing. Yeah blows up into something that is not even what the, what it was to begin with. Well, given perspective right. on it also, that, like in a long enough time frame, nothing mattered. Oh, agreed. Over a long enough time frame. I mean, the conversation we're having right now mimics the exact same thing that maybe a Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus or, you know, a Nero or like name any Socrates, you know, Aristotle. These are the conversations these guys were having thousands of years. Absolutely. You know, and th this is, you know, n new to have an esoteric conversation or something where some people think this is oh, fucking boring. Yeah. It's not, not new. We're not inventing something different. It's just our turn. And over a long enough timeline, some people will grab onto the information that we shared to pull themselves out of whatever moment they're in. And most will never know. It'll fade off. Oh, man. Totally. In fact, what's irony of ironies is that, um, those guys, philosophers, like I don't, I don't even think people really understand what philosophers did philosophy for. That's mm -hmm. the that's the funny part. <laughs> but they were literally working on what we're talking about. They, they were literally working on how do we break free from this feeling of separation. How do we find a more unified nature in humanity to build upon? And and it's it's this loss of. Well, you got to add in the one piece. How do we do that using language? Yes. This thing that is circular in itself. How do we use the words that we made up to describe things with words that we made up? Yes. And how do we be able that? to do that? Well, and then how yeah. do we do the connection and do all this? And then, and then we argue about the, and then the words are the thing that create the discrepancies in oh, how yeah. we can connect. What I think oh. is respect is not what you think is respect is in my way. I like better than your way. So your way is dumb and we're going to scream at each other. Yes. Yes. I love it. No, that's so true. That is so true. I used to make the argument that the Bible is a circular argument until I realized, well, there's nothing that I say or do that isn't a circular argument. All of this. However, whatever word you use, I have to be able to understand what that word means to you before we can. Re that's why I have to go esoteric. That's yeah. why. I'm so tired of people telling me things that like we claim beliefs in our world and, and then we unify around them, but then you can go sit down with someone and 
ask them, ask them, you know, go to a Trump rally and ask what it means to support President Trump. And all of them are going to give you all the cliches and then none of them know what they mean. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean <laughs> or they in, have at least what I mean. anything. You could actually, I, I, this is one of my favorite things. And we could do an entire Trump, episode on just. Trump, guys. <laughs> Good for you. Well, it's any belief system. It's not even just Trump stuff. It's just any belief system. It's any belief of them. System. Um, if you ask people, why do you do this? Everyone will have a different answer. And this gets into everything. Like, um, why do you trust? What do you think leadership means? You'll have a hundred different answers. Yeah. You know, what do you think love really means? What is love? We all want it. What is it? What's respect? Like, what are these words? Like, we use these all, every day. This is like, you need to be respectful. It's like, okay, I want to. What is it? Yeah. Fuck, I don't know. Like, these are the words that we use that we're trying to convey that we should all be agreeing, even though we can't agree on the word. And it's because a lot of these words, especially joy, being this compassion, these all have very different definitions based on our experiences. And yet, somehow you're supposed to know what mine is, considering you have a very different set of experiences yeah, and a very different definition. And yet, yours is wrong. And 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 you are bringing up the key component to why throughout history, uh, breath has been such a key component of, of getting back into your, into oneness. So meditation and being able to sit with breath because it's in the breath. In fact, we can go to our, our own Judeo Christian ideal ideology of Yahweh. Like there is a, there is an idea out there that that, that the term was not a sayable word, but mm-hmm. it was the actual breath. And so this notion of breathing when I can do that and I can recognize, oh, you breathe, I breathe, we can agree on that. There's, there's no way around the fact that we breathe and we are breathing in the same o- oxygen that is given to us. And that's why that esoteric flavor is in me because it's like the micro, we, we tend to get so nitty gritty. We don't even go to the micro anymore. We just kind of get into these petty little arguments that really don't deal with the fullness of where we're at, that micro and the macro are the true nature, the true reflective nature of God at, at work. It's the unexplainables. You know, I talked about how, ins- how small I am in the scheme of that. Well, how small is your pinky? How, how small is your, uh, my, my, my bio- biology is not very good, but I'm, the, the pineal gland, how big is the pineal gland? And yet, how critical! I love, it? I love how much you're playing around with how close everyone's. He's gonna say penis. He's gonna I, say. He's gonna say it. He's gonna no, do it. No, I, but I'm happy <laughs> to. How, how far? I mean, how, look at just look how small your pineal is. Creature. Oh, I thought he was gonna say it. And what about your pineal gland? Right? Well, he's like he's gonna know, say penis. He's gonna say it. I can't <laughs> say that. It would be relevant to me. So I mean, what? Can right? I'm like. I mean, I'm talking about male. these other dudes, right? <laughs> male. Male. It just felt like he was gonna say it though. He's gonna say it. He's gonna say he's gonna say fucking penis. But it could but it could be that for some of us. <laughs> and, like, and that's listen, in the grand scale of the universe, we all have tiny penises. I'm just saying. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> and and nothing to compare it to. I mean, as that's far as the size get, of a star or a galaxy. I know. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a small micro uh, uh, fragment of a star. <laughs> anyway, I, well, took we it, I, took it, I took it in the weeds. I took it in the weeds. I, I love it. Weeds. I love it. No, you know that I guarantee you someone's like, thank you. I knew he was. That's what I was thinking. Somebody said it. Well, <laughs> all I'm saying is that each one of us have these a lot of little things inside of us that are very key to our actual being able to breathe, to have that. I mean, my wife with chronic myeloid leukemia is dealing with blood issues. I mean, you know, like issues inside of her bone marrow and the cells that are there. How critical is that to us? Well, it's obviously very critical that all those little things that are in running around inside of us are critical to the survival of this body. And I think we have to begin to see that that's what God is doing with us, mm-hmm. is that we are these little, these little conduits of life that express a certain nature of God that, that is important to what God is doing. And so it, it's meaningless in the scheme of, I can't. I can't destroy what is what's already been put into place. Like I can't destroy this God. And and the beautiful thing is, is that in that in that same vein, yes, while certain things could happen inside of my body that could cause me to die, 
this thing is is got backup plans and and secondary operating systems and tertiary weaponry or whatever you want to call it to make sure all times this whole thing is at the macro to the micro going to last for eternity and and the only that's even too small to be thinking about like that's not even a big enough statement to really describe what's really going on well we can't but see it eternity give, beyond ourselves yeah but it does give me purpose it does give me hope it does give me meaning it does give me this understanding that no matter what i'm going through in that moment there is is something that is going to heal that within me and for some of us that could be the end for sure but that doesn't mean that it's not healing. And, and that's why it's so important for us to begin to really understand this, the nature of separation versus wholeness and oneness. Yeah, at least I, in- I think it's such an interesting thing because there needs to also be a degree of balance between this. Because if you go so far into like, look at the size of a, I am a speck, like if you really take it, take it like, you know, I'm a speck in, my, I'm like in the map of my house. I'm one little tiny dot in the house. And then you scoop back the size of the, the city. I'm that one little dot in the city. Pull back. I'm the dot in the state. I'm the dot in the country. I'm a speck on the world. And then our world is the dot in the universe. And then our universe is just a dot in the galaxy. And then our galaxy is the dot amongst galaxies. And like how small we really are all the way down to like your problem. Yeah. And what are you mad at? Let's go yeah. ahead and look at the relevance. So if we have this aspect of things of like, we have this, like, which of course is already too abstract. It's already so big now that it's like, it's become irrelevant of an argument because I can't even connect to it anymore, but it's reality. And then because of that, like we start still holding on to how far we can see the relevance of our things truly are. I'm really mad because, and then insert what it is that you created an injustice for an unmet need for. And why you put so much importance on. And I think it gets right back to when you talked about the ego. Mm -hmm. Our ego is not our amigo. This is the part where like we think that our little tiny thing that nobody will ever care about at all on a long enough timeline is so important that everyone should be stopping to hear me talk about it. And if you're not going to stop and listen, allow me to get louder. Yeah. And I'll start screaming and yelling and tantruming and throwing things and doing whatever things makes you notice my problem, which even in a timeline of one month, no one will care about. Oh, absolutely. Let alone eternity. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, and I here think, we are. think it is, is that danger. And, and I think that's the answer in my mind. And I know you've got some, some more grounded, probably level degree of explanation for this, but when it comes to anxiety, it is for me that strange fear that what I'm doing is irrelevant, meaning that it is separated from all the other good things that I think and perceive is are being done around me. And part of it. And so much so much of that is so much of that is built on so much of that is built on the the expectations of how I thought I was supposed to operate in this world. Does this make sense? Yeah. So, well, you're getting into the, the make believe of what it should be. That's right. The, the shoulds, the shoulds that kill us. Yeah. And, and I, I, I would even, you know, I don't want to be insensitive to anyone who's actually dealing with some stuff. Guys, I'm, I mean, I, I started this whole thing off by telling you, Rick's my dude. I, when the shit hits the fan, I got somebody that I can call. And, and the reason for that is, is because I recognize that I have a, I'm having a tendency in that moment, in my anxious moment, to see myself as separate. It takes the awareness and the on, uh, honesty to be able to say, that's what I'm actually pursuing is in this moment, I want to feel so separated so that I can feel the pain so deeply. It allows me to honestly feel like I got something to control. Interesting. That, that, that for me, when I'm in that moment, it's, I feel uncontrollable, and yet, all right, I, I I told this to my wife the other day. I found myself looking to see if she was watching during a tantrum that I was having. And I noticed in the moment that my tantrum was bigger than it was when she wasn't looking. And I went, huh. I don't know how I had the awareness in the moment of this because I had lost it. See but, me. But I, I, but it I was in that see me. 
And, and the threat that I gave to her was separation. Mm -hmm. Literal, but in that moment, it was a separation. It was, I'll leave. And, and, it's, and it's the absolute opposite of what both of us needed in that moment mm -hmm. because egos believe that we are somehow different than every other ego that has ever existed. It believes that it's better than and worse than all at the same time. And it's out to, to make sure it's an overprotective parent. Mm -hmm. It's an overprotective self. And it has a place. We all needed parents. We all need guidance. And we all need safety systems in place to survive as humans. But we've put this thing in the pilot seat. And we've said no to anything that is, we're going to call it esoteric or God-related. And it's the saddest part about like that whole Yahweh discussion that we just had. Like if, that, if, they, if the operation of that was to sit and breathe the name and recognize that my breath was the thing that I could not control and it's something bigger than me, that is the space to land in those moments for me. Well, that's because, because you're trying to find a thing that makes it so you have connection. I find that's irony that. in it. Here's the irony. And it goes, it goes full circle on this one. You said, I need to separate so I can get control, right? I need, oh, my camera, what's going on here? Okay. I need to separate so I can get control. So I need, so I can figure this out, right? At separation to get control so you can understand belonging so I can have connection again. And my goal was to get connection, but I'm not getting connection. So I'm going to threaten separation. So I have control again. Yes. And that control is so then later I can control how belonging works between you and me. That's right. So that way I can have connection again. And it, it's a contradiction, of course. Well, which is the irony have, to it. But you don't have to land there. But then you if you go into... That. If Don't you look on. at the problem that I'm using right now as a reason that I would threaten separation to get control of belonging for connection, the problem itself is extremely irrelevant outside of even my own space. Uh, yeah. Yes. So here I am trying to separate myself to get control for connection on something that's completely irrelevant beyond even yeah. my own bedroom. Yes. Yeah. That is. And, and what do we often do in those moments too? We go to the things that we call, we think are controllable and use them in an uncontrolled manner. So we go to drinking. Mm -hmm. Coping, yeah. <laughs> we maybe go to porn. We go to, who knows what it is for food. dude. Is dude. it food? We go to dude. food. Well, the thing emotionally, any addiction, uh, medication, uh, drinking, yeah. emotional eating. Um, you've got distractions. You get into uh, not just big drug stuff, but even like, uh, you know, Netflix, social media. Pick, it, pick your poison. Yeah. I mean, it could be it's a mountaintop. Deni you. Denial distractions back at the top again. That's where I'm going up the mountain. Months. So I'll see you in 10 days. You know, it could be whatever you want it to be that, that ultimately if anything that allows you to feel like you are controlling the situation, perceiving that you are controlling the situation because well, it's, so controlling, much it's controlling connection, all of it. Yeah. If you looked at all of it, I'm going to try and control connection. And there's a, another lady. I like to watch Teal Swan. I like her stuff. Um, and she thinks that everything is connection. I go into choice, which is where it'd be fun to have the, the debate on things. But she says that it's not choice, it's connection. That's what we're all trying to do. And there's definitely value to what she's saying. She's not crazy by any means. There's a lot of value to it. And sure. I, I'd, I'd like to be able to have like a deeper dive into her because she goes more the um, more of a spiritual energy route than I do. I go far more like practical application step by step. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's neat to see the different perspectives on it. But it's funny that you're trying to have so much control over connection when really the way to get connection is to not try to control it. Oh, 100%. I'm not saying that. And so that's, that was my ego's way is the thing that... So there is a moment in, the, in those where I'm being so incredible. Like I am very connected to... I'm connected to me. Not even connected to Heatherly in that moment, right? Or, or I've had fights with other, other dudes and it's been, it's a moment where I'm not connected to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm actually starting to buy into what's being said to me in those moments. And it's in those moments that I start to question my own integrity, question my own motives, my, my own intentions. And my ego is going, this is a red flag. You're not safe. Mm -hmm. And so it kicks into overdrive and it's not my sane conscious self that's doing this. This is, my, this is my ego that has been given way too much control in life. I've turned to it too often. 
I have appeased it way too much. It's a habitual response is coming from that place of ego. In that moment, it takes me the time to separate, not because it's necessary that I had to. It's that sometimes that ego is like, okay, the only way to do this is to show her. And as soon as I'm away from it, as soon as I'm away from it, usually it takes me like 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, I'm in the car. And I'm about to start up the engine because I got to go for a drive. And I'm like, this is really unnecessary. Like, I really just need to go in and hug her. And yet we've both been charged, right? And so we both have our egos are like, oh no, I'm not ready for that. Yeah. It's, so, it so it's two different minds that are happening there. It's not that I go into to separation for the purpose of getting control of connection. It's that I go into separation because I'm like, I can do this on my own. I don't need this. I'm and then disconnected, on, yeah. And so later on, I get reconnected to my breath and to myself, and I'm able to go, oh, <laughs> sorry, this is overly simplified for the, some of you, but it's powerful when you can realize it. Oh, we breathe the same air. Oh, that's right. Of course, we're upset with each other because we forgot that we breathe the same air. And we, we started to make it about whatever it was, what would be about in that moment. Mm -hmm. It could have been the dishes. It could have been money. It could have been, you know, you know, how we were engaging with our children, our adult children, who knows what it is, but it's just this one little moment and it takes one of us. And then they start to tell a story we don't, we don't align with and our ego. It's the story that there's a monster under the bed. It's a story that there's a, you know, a T-Rex about to attack and it wasn't ever there. There's no, there's no truth to it. There was a time when our ego needed to be that involved, but I don't, at least, at least that's what I hear. I wasn't there. So I don't know. <laughs> don't know for sure. That's what they tell us. What they there's, tell us. There's partial truths to it. And there are yeah. truths to it. There's experience or there's a fear that's there. And there is truth to it. You have a T-Rex behind you. Yeah. <laughs> you, you want to make me look, huh? Is that what it is? I can see him. He's on top of that stack of books. <laughs> that one right there. Yeah. I do. I literally have a T-Rex behind me. Yeah. So, Which I mean, like. My <laughs> also, I was playing with that thing when we were, we were at a store and I was the Andrea hated the tongue thing. I kept making it liquor. Anyways, <laughs> but uh, no, there's there's partial truths to our realities in these things, and the partial truths get expanded upon by our in, incredible imagination systems and our creativity, and we start creating even tougher realities that we have to protect ourselves from. If we go deep, we go deep. Fear is an interesting thing. I'm gonna I'm directly fighting it this month. I'm going right in at fear. It's not real. And a lot of times the things we're holding on to is definitely you the fear. yourself or for your community for my or community. Both. I fear yeah. is not my factor. I do not care. I, I will smack fear in his face. I am not worried. Danger different. We got to watch out for danger. Fear yeah. though. Fear is not my factor. Yeah. I love and, that. And so fear. I'm not, I am not worried about that one. So as far as that one goes, like I'm going to show people that this is a lot of times just smoke monsters. They're not real. You know, there are things that, like, if you turn the light on, they disappear. But we are afraid to turn the light on even because we don't know what we're going to see. And I may have to deal with whatever it is, but you turn on the light and it's not even there. Yeah. It's it's like 99.9 .9 out of 100. There's that .01 that there's some shit, and that means now we're in danger, not in fear. So get it. Sure, sure. And that's a different deal altogether. So in which case, um, the bigger thing, even when it comes to fear, I, I'm, I'm swinging it right back to the fear of irrelevance. The fear mm -hmm. of not feeling important, the fear of, fear of, you know, not feeling good enough, the fear of I have to explain myself so that you understand the fear of needing to control and uh, using separation as a means to do so. The fear of, you know, maybe or maybe not the farmer story, the fear of not being able to have, give yourself the gift of awareness of what's going on right now. I call that giving yourself a present of being present in the present. A lot of presents. You see, yeah, well, I'm a gift giver. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, but that's like clever. It. It's three different meanings for one word and one sentence. I actually am using that for some of the people. But give yourself yeah. the present of being present in the present, and you'll realize the things that you're afraid of aren't even happening. And mm -hmm. if you expand that out into the series of how small we are in the universe for irrelevance, none of it matters anyways. In Not irrelevant. Case, Not irrelevant. Completely relevant. We're just not the end all, be all. Of relevant correct in which case that thing that we're holding on to then yeah it's only as relevant as our circle will allow us to see 
Uh, which, let's be real, is not very far. No. Even well, the they, fact that we're creating, even with the conversations we have with the people, not even this, just when we really coach and when we really work with people. Um, one of my guys says, you don't understand, bro. You pulled me out of hell. And now I know how to be a better man. I didn't know how to do this. And I have two boys. You helped me. Now I help them and they help their boys. You don't know that breaking that generational curse has now given my boys a new chance that they weren't going to have. And we will yeah. never know how far that reaches. Yeah. So the relevance comes down to our perception and our awareness of how far we can see, but we can't see. Yeah. So your perceived fear of irrelevance now becomes only as real as you believe it is, which leads me all the way back to, well, if that's it, and it's only as far as we believe, how much do you believe in yourself? Mm. Because mm. if you believe it's only as far as you can see, well, then you're not moving because we can't see that far. But if you have faith and believe in yourself versus what? Not believing in myself. Yeah. Then we're going to go ahead and take everything personal. We're going to yeah. get upset and mad. We're going to try and control everybody because we don't have control. And we're going to try and control even the way we're handling things with coping or anger or sadness or lying to ourselves or making up different realities and distracting ourselves just to get through. And each one of these takes away our life. And that's how we end up spending our minutes living a different life. It's an interesting concept to talk about belief in self. Uh, because I wonder if that's a direct, direct proportion to our ability to believe in something bigger than ourselves. It is. I mean, if you get into where does, where does your worth come from, it does get bigger, yes. But just yeah. even to have like, even beyond going like, do I believe my purpose comes from grand design? That obviously that leap has to be built upon. And it first has to go, do you believe that you're worth more than just existing? Yeah. And that gets into like, well, if I say yes, then it opens up. Well, can you believe that where you're created from has more value than just chaos? You're not an yeah. accident. You're not just a momentary grouping of molecules that don't matter or energy that's compounded that will be released. Do you believe there's any purpose? Otherwise, the only thing constraining you from doing whatever you want is just human law. And that's corrupt. And I think you nailed it that you just summarized. Well, actually, it wasn't a summary because the summary would be what I, this next statement, even though it's you just described it. You described the whole notion of faith without works is dead. Mm-hmm. Like the essence of of faith being that do you believe in in something bigger than yourself and that you operate within that? And if you don't and you find yourself irrelevant in that state, then you're you're not not gonna have any works. You can even believe there's you can even believe there's a God. But if you don't have the understanding that you matter in the scheme of that, then you're not gonna do any work. And yeah. that makes you dead. And so many people are walking around as Dead men, dead women walking. Dead so men and women walking. Let's leave them with a question then. Here's the like question it. then. Before we start getting into the faith and all the stuff that goes along with it, let's just start off with the base question to even get started, to even go in any direction for any of those things, whether it be, uh, you know, the faith aspect of it, love thyself, or even what services do I do I provide and does it even matter? The question is, do you believe you are worth believing in? That's a big one. Yeah. Do you even believe that you're worth it? Let's go yeah. ahead and like, like write it down. Do I believe I'm even worth believing in for someone to say, Hey, Les, I believe in you, man. I know you can do it. It doesn't mean you're doing it alone. You can have God, a higher power, law of attraction, law of magnetism. You use whatever ones. God made them all. So it doesn't matter which thing you use. Like, so use whatever one you want to use, but do you believe that you're worth believing in to do it? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave them with that one and write it down because it, I've had some experts I've worked with who's like, it's taken them a few weeks and they're still like, I'm still sorting that it's bigger than I thought. It's yeah. more than just, yeah, I believe in myself. No, it's no. Where does that worth come from to say, are you worth believing it? And if you think it's just me, didn't really think of. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Very good, man. That is good. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna answer the question for anyone. Oh god, no, we gotta go. We gotta get out of here. So, in any case, I hope you guys uh got a lot from this conversation. This is some pretty heavy stuff, but Les, I'm actually I'm pretty proud of you, man. Oh, it's never gonna I actually really enjoyed that you went into the more esoteric answers when a lot of times you try and pull it back. And so I thought that was kind of fun. I appreciate you for that. Well, thanks. So it was fun to do so. And I like leaning into that stuff. So. Let's do more. And so yes, on, that, on that note, warriors and men of the bearded wisdom, guys who are all alphas and leading in their own packs, uh, we honor you. Thank you guys for making it this long. If you made it this far, uh, you're a hero amongst humans. So way to go. And Otherwise, we have a lot more future conversations that are coming up on both uh, the Warrior's Way mindset, which is the battlefield of the mind, and the bearded wisdom. So, bless. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, brother. Peace right. to you. Let's get out of here.